This is lecture 15 of PDEs. It's our first post-COVID lockdown lecture. Today I'm going to look at two examples of how to generate a Green's function on various domains. The first will be a circle and the second will be a rectangle. Just a note, I'll be making a break in between the two lectures, so you're welcome to get coffee in between. The first example of generating a Green's function will make use of what we did in the past in lecture what's it, 13, um, where we derived the symmetrical Green's function, and then in lecture 14 we showed that a general Green's function can be constructed out by adding an additional potential to the symmetrical Green's function. So here's a specific example applying this method. Okay, so firstly we're going to look on a disk, so we have a circular domain of um, with radius A, and we want to find the Green's function for the differential equation Laplace U is equals to G, so any source, and um, we want it on a domain of a disk, so we write the disk this way, so roughly everything inside this area where the radius of the disk is A, um, we're going to look in specifically at Dirichlet boundary conditions. As I showed in the previous lecture, you can find Green's functions for a variety of boundary conditions. In this example, I've just chosen Dirichlet boundary conditions. Um, and that basically means that we've specified the function on the boundary, which in this case is simply the circle um, x squared plus y squared is equals to a. So this being the boundary of the domain that we're interested in. So let us proceed along the way that we define the Green's function. We're going to say let P, in other words, P of x, y be a field point, let Q be a source point, and um, what we're then going to do is let R be the vector that connects the two. In other words, it's basically um, x prime minus x, so x prime minus x, y prime minus y, um, uh, and then in, it points in the direction that connects the two, um, the source and the field points. Further, let us say that R1 is the norm of this vector without um, bold font. And then, as I showed in the previous two lectures, it is possible to set G equals to the lin of R1 over 2 pi, pi plus V1, a different potential, of the coordinates that um, parameterize the source point, sorry, the field point and the source point. Okay, where we've required that V1 or the Laplace of V1 with respect to the coordinates describing the source point is zero all over D. Um, and on C, we specify the boundary conditions and we want that basically G is equals to zero on C, therefore, V1 restricted to C must just be minus lin of R1 over 2 pi. Okay, and if our condition of our function G is written in this way, we know that the Laplace of G satisfies the Green's function equation, namely delta of R1, because this first term does and the second term is zero. Okay, and we further know that g is equal to zero on c just as required by the definition of our Green's function with Dirichlet boundary conditions because um, we've used v1 to cancel out the contribution on the boundary of our symmetrical solution. And the trick now is to actually construct a v1 such that this is true. Okay, so just as to sort of get more specific, in the specific case where Q, um, we evaluate the Green's function on the boundary, just to get a geometric feel for that, what we have is that Q varies along the circumference of the circle A. Um, and it is only in that case where we actually want to require that this boundary condition holds. Um, it's basically, in that case, rho is equals, equals to A, and then we want V1 to be equals to the lin of R1 over 2 pi. Just another comment before we proceed further. It's there are two sets of coordinates that can, prov that can describe our source and field points. The one is X and Y, 
But a second equivalent set is our polar coordinates, namely r and theta in the case of the field point and rho and phi in the case of the source point. Okay. And these I'll be using interchangeably because depending on which scenario is easier. Um, so here in the, the requirement that the source point is on the boundary is simply that a rho, which describes it, is equals to a. Okay, so in order to in construct this function and to ensure that it's equal onto the boundary, we need some gen geometric considerations first. And the first comment is um, uh, when we were looking at the specific example of looking for the solution of Laplace equation is equals to zero on the disk and using analytic methods sort of, of the associated with Cauchy's integral theorem and Cauchy's theorem for analytic functions, what we had um, is that we derived that using the ideas from complex analysis back in lecture 10. And we found that something arose that looked much as if it arose from the cosine rule. And this now gives you how, uh, sort of a clear indication of how this originates. Okay, so just the, the norm squared of the vector that joins your source and your field point is R1 squared. And simply using the cosine rule, we can write down what that value is in terms of um, the polar coordinates associated with the source and the field points. And that just becomes R1 squared is equals to R squared plus rho squared plus, um, sorry, minus to R rho, um, the cosine of this angle basically the, the angle that lies between P, O, Q, okay, which is just theta minus phi. And similarly, if you have another point, which I haven't really discussed, um, P prime, that lies outside our domain, and you have an R2 over here, you can also write down the value of R2, and that simply equals to rho squared R, which is this large distance, um, between the origin and p prime minus 2 r rho cos of theta minus phi. And the reason for doing that is that we want to construct v1. Okay, that it is value on the boundary is equals to lin of r1. In other words, we want a function so that regardless of where q is on the boundary, we can exactly cancel out this um, lin of r1 but we cannot have V1 simply equals to the lin of R1. Okay, so what we do is we say, let's start with a trial solution. And this trial solution um, is informed by many things. The one is basically experience. Um, and the other one is a technique that we will possibly touch on later, namely the method of images, where in some sense you view this field point where you want to know where the function is, as say, for example, a, a charge, and you want to put another charge outside that exactly cancels out the effect of this charge, but is not part of the domain itself. Um, and that's sort of why we choose this function V2 equals to minus lin of lambda R2 over 2 pi. Okay. And if we just expand that, we get that, sorry, V1 is equals to this lin of lambda over 2 pi, where lambda is a constant that we're going to determine, minus lin of, of R2 over 2 pi. Okay, and we can immediately see that um, V1 satisfies Laplace's equation. This is a constant, so its derivatives are zero. And um, the second one is not a constant. It depends on the coordinates of x prime, y prime, because q enters into it, its definition. Um, but what is also true is you can view it as trying to evaluate uh, the lin, which is secondary or which obeys basically um, the symmetric Green function equation, except that R2 which is constructed out of p prime, you never traverse the point in the domain um, where the delta function has a spike. In other words, the lin of this guy is identically zero because p prime lies outside of the domain. 
Okay, so you can basically use the derivation for saying that R1 satisfies Green's equation. Um, the same derivation applies to R2, except that the delta function is never non-zero because R2 lies outside of the domain. So this V2 defined this way satisfies our condition that the Laplace squared of, sorry, our V1 defined this way satisfies the condition that Laplace squared of V1 is equals to zero. Okay, so I'm just saying this, V1 is independent of the point Q um, and therefore of rho and phi. And now we can write down the condition on lambda so that V1 actually cancels the boundary condition due to the symmetrical solution. Okay, and this occurs if we choose um, R1 so that it is equals to lambda R2 on the boundary. Okay, so if we do that, we satisfy our boundary condition exactly. And the way we do that is simply to write down this condition. Okay, and the way we write down that condition is we square it, and then we substitute in these results from our cosine rule. So we basically have that for the con boundary condition to hold, you have r squared plus rho squared minus 2 r rho cos of theta minus phi, um, where rho has now been fixed to a, we have that that must be equals to lambda squared times um, rho squared, which is a, plus r squared minus 2 r rho cos of theta minus phi. And we want that condition to hold for all of um, phi. Okay. So this condition basically, or this equation basically results in two conditions. The first one is suppose phi or theta minus phi is zero. In other words, the boundary lies or the, the boundary point lies over here between P and P prime. Then in particular, this uh, condition must hold. So we can basically say that R squared plus A squared is equal to lambda squared um, times A squared plus big R squared. But we also want it to, to hold while we vary um, theta minus phi. In other words, as Q, Q traverses the circle. So in addition to this condition, we want to require that RA is equal to lambda squared big RA. Okay. And simplifying the second condition immediately gives us um, that our small r is equals to lambda squared r. So that's our first reasonably simple condition. And what we do then is substitute this one into the first condition and simplify it somewhat. Okay, so here we've just taken r is equal to lambda squared r, and every place where r appears, we substitute it in, and we then factor the result, and we get lambda squared minus 1, times lambda squared big R squared minus A squared is equals to zero. Okay, so there are two ways of satisfying this equation. The first one is um, if lambda is equals to one. Okay, however, that would immediately imply that um, R1 is equals to R2, but that can never be because we have chosen P prime to lie outside the domain and P to lie inside the disk D. Okay, so that condition is excluded. So we're left with that lambda is equals to um, A over R. Okay. And then immediately we can put it back into um, this equation over here and we can get an expression for big R. Right, so the condition that V is satisfies the boundary conditions allows us with this geometric construction, we've not only shown that it is possible because V1 obeys Laplace um, is equals to zero on the domain, although possibly not on the whole plane because this thing has a delta function the moment your source point goes outside the domain. We've shown that V equals Laplace equals to zero on the domain of interest, but we've also shown that V1, um, written in this form, where lambda is equals to 
um, A over R, and R is equals to A squared over R, um, obeys our boundary conditions. And we've also fixed with this argument that this, the choice of where P is, in other words, P lies in the same direction from the origin, as, sorry, P prime lies in the same direction from the origin as P, um, and its distance is basically fixed to be, or its length is basically fixed to be a squared of r. And if you recall, when we were solving um, uh, Laplace equals to zero on the circular disk um, using the complex analysis methods, we found the same choice. We were also making, adding an additional point that was equals to a squared over the complex conjugate of our complex function, and the same distance um, magnitude arose. Okay. So, just to summarize, um, we've chosen lambda from geometric um, considerations. We have our Green's function given explicitly, and I'm just going to massage it a little bit. Okay, by substituting in what we've derived on the previous slide. So substituting in the value of lambda, we have that this function that we've added to V1 um, is simply minus 1 over 2 pi lin of R, R2 over A. We then added to our symmetrical solution R1 to give our complete Green's function whose, bound, whose value on the boundary is equals to zero. And um, we then simply can just very quickly check that the Green's function um, does in fact obey um, all the conditions we have. Okay, and the first being that it's equals to the delta function of R1, which we can see immediately from that term in our derivation in lecture 13. Um, and the other terms don't contribute. In other words, R1, R over A are not dependent on our source term Q, so therefore the Laplace equation with respect to um, the um, source coordinates is just zero. R2 does depend on this thing, okay, and effectively the um, Laplace equation of R2 would give you a delta function of R2, but because P prime equal, is, lies outside the domain, it's never zero. Okay, so it doesn't contribute. So this thing basically does obey um, Green's equation. And we also have that on the boundary, okay, G explicitly evaluates to lin of A over R lambda, okay, where lambda is just the ratio R1 over R2, and we found that to be on the boundary, and we found that to be just R over A. So it's a lin of 1, which is 0. Okay, so given this Green's function, we can now write down U as we derived in um, lecture 13 in terms of the Green's function and the source um, evaluated at the, oh, sorry, and the forcing function evaluated at the source, so that's the integral over the actual disk, D, plus an integral over the boundary um, where the boundary of the derivative of the Green's function with respect to the normal, where um, u has been specified on the boundary itself. Okay, and what I want to do next is just simply write this down explicitly. Okay, it's, we've been sort of dealing with the abstract and correct notation thus far, but I just want to give you a concrete example of how we go about writing this out in terms of coordinates and, and specifically um, our polar coordinates. So the first term to look at is this integral over the boundary. Okay, and if we write it out, this disk is basically the integral. We rho, because we're integrating over the prime coordinates, so rho goes from 0 to a, and phi goes from 0 to 2 pi. Okay, but remember when you write down this area element, you have to add the square... Um, the square root of the norm of the Jacobian. Okay, so there we basically have it. In that square root is just rho d phi d rho. So this is our area element. There we have d rho varying from 0 to a. So basically rho varying from 0 to a, to the boundary. 
and we have phi integrating over the whole disk. Okay, and g is merely our forcing function now expressed in terms of rho and phi. This Green's function, if you look at it carefully, will t contain both rho and phi in R1 and R2, but it can also contain R and theta in both R1 and R2 and explicitly here in R. Okay. Um, the second term, which is in the integral on the boundary, is given here. Once again, the ds part we must account for the square root of the Jacobian entering, or the normal, or the determinant of the Jacobian enter, which is just a, and the integral is over the whole boundary, so it is simply zero to two pi, where d phi varies as you traverse the circle over here. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to expand this last part, so but I'm going to do it in a specific case where g is equals to zero. And the reason I'm going to do is that is because we've actually derived the solution to this equation using the complex um, analysis methods in lecture 10. And I just want to show that this result holds and, in fact, is exactly identical to the result we obtained there. Okay, you have a similar example in your test, just an easier one. So this is one example, way of doing that. Okay, so in the case where g is equals to zero, we're only interested in this integral along the boundary. So let's make our sketch where we have basically, okay, okay, where we've basically moved q, um, our source point, onto the boundary, and we want to look how it, um, how to actually write down explicitly this integral that we have over here. Okay. So the first thing to note is that this dgdn is the derivative of our Green's function with respect to n. Okay, so that's a normal vector to the boundary. So the way you work that out is just to work out the gradient of g and then dot it with a normal vector to the boundary. And here the normal vector to the boundary of the circle just always points in the radial direction. Okay, so here dgdn just becomes dg d rho and u is specified as a function on the boundary but it's specified just as a function of theta of phi as it varies around the boundary okay so there we have it explicitly written out and the rest of this part of basically proving the equivalence between the result derived in lecture 10 and this result obtained from the greens function relies on the evaluation of dg d rho explicitly. Okay, and let's just compute that now as an example. And the way we do it is simply to take the derivative systematically of the Green's function we've computed. And I'll show you how to do this. So the first thing to observe is dg d rho of lin is just 1 over whatever's in the brackets. Okay, so it's 1 over what's ever in the brackets, multiplied the derivative of what was in the brackets. But as I have mentioned several times, A and R is not dependent on Q. Therefore, you can take it out. Okay, and you're left with DD rho of R1 over R2. You can also see which R dependent of Q, because as you vary Q, both R1 and R2 changes. What you can also see here is that this thing cancels out nicely. Okay, so what we're now going to do next is expand um, this term over here. And what we get is that dg d rho is equals to 1 over 2 pi um, uh, multiplying this thing. So we've basically used the quotient rule to obtain, um, to differentiate this term. And then I've um, basically massaged it a little bit and taken out R1, R2 as a numerator to write it in a roughly symmetrical form. The next step is to um, find expressions for R1, the R1 d rho and the R2 d rho. But we don't, they are slightly hard. What we do know is R1 squared in terms of rho and, um, and, we, and cos of theta minus phi, and the similarly with R2 in terms of rho and big R and cos of theta over phi. So what I want to do now 
is I want to write these derivatives with respect to r1 squared and r2 squared. And you can do that, and what you get is something like this. Okay, so if you, the easiest is just to verify this thing by differentiating this guy, you basically get back that combination of terms and by differentiating the second term similarly. And now what we can do is to use our results that we had from the cosine rule or expressions we got from the cosine rule for r1 squared and r2 squared to explicitly evaluate this last term. Okay, so there's the expression for r1 squared. So dd rho of that thing is just equals to 2 rho minus 2 r cos of theta minus phi. Similarly, here yeah, we have the cosine rule for r2 squared. So if we take the derivatives with respect to rho, you get a very similar expression. And on the boundary where the integral is evaluated, we know that rho is equals to a, so we can substitute that in there as well as in there. And we also have an expression for big R, and that's simply equals to a squared over R. Okay, so that is fixed and that's fixed not just on the boundary. And finally, we have one more condition, okay, which will be useful when we substitute these definitions back into um, the expression for the derivative. We ha also have that r2 is just equal, sorry, r1 is just equal to lambda r2, or r2 is given to equals to a over r of multiplied by r1. So given all these facts, we can now write down dg d rho on the boundary as in, which is equals to this as an intermediary step we've replaced r2 squared by a over r r1 um, and we can take a further step substituting in our definitions for the derivatives to get this expression okay so here's the r1 squared d rho comes from there we have changed the row to a because we're on the boundary and similarly here is dr2 squared multiplied by this r squared over a squared term um, where rho is mean we have substituted a for rho and big r um, for a squared over r times cos phi and the amazing thing of this thing is that there's a beautiful cancellation if you look very carefully at the coefficient in, in front of cos of theta minus phi, you have that, here you have r, r times this term, and here you basically have these a's cancel, one of the r's cancel, so you have exactly, you sort of adding um, the same term to the negative of that term, and these two cancel, and this thing simplifies beautifully to just um, 1 over 2 pi r1 squared, a minus r squared over a. And the next step, because we want to write the integral explicitly in terms of um, our polar coordinates, is to expand this r1 squared using our cosine rule on the boundary. Okay, and what I've also done is I've taken out this a and placed it there. So I have a squared minus r squared over the expression for r1 squared on the boundary that just comes from the cosine rule. And you can then go out and substitute this back into the expression of u in terms of the Green's function evaluated on the boundary, which we found on the previous slide. And we just have that u of r of theta is equal to the integral of f, which is the function for u, the specified on the boundary, times d rho, dg d rho, times your um, uh, integrating factor, and we get explicitly this expression um, where this a has cancelled out with this a over here um, in the gradient of um, g and this is exactly the same result as we got by applying Cauchy's integral theorem and Cauchy's theorem for analytic functions to the complex plane in lecture 10. Okay so I encourage you to actually go through this derivation step by step, but when um, once you've got the result of u, it's unique.
and it should be the same regardless of the way you've derived it. The f powerful thing about the Green's function is it basically expands um, this relation that we got for the source-free Laplace equation and it allows us to write down the solution for a Laplace equation with source, in other words, for, function, for Laplace equations where g is non-zero. Okay, so this is the end of my first example. Um, I'll return with a new video for the second one. Thank you very much.